I uh, thank you and you for inviting me to share um, Children My Choice's story around reproductive coercion um, and its link with unplanned pregnancy and abortion. And I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians on the land that we gather on both here in Queensland and obviously in the very far flung places down where you guys are. Um, and thank you for um, taking some time out to um, be here tonight. Um, for those of you who don't know, Children by Choice is a very small not-for-profit organization based in Brisbane and um, providing statewide um, information and counseling around all options with an unplanned pregnancy. And we've been around since 1972. Um, and a lot of the work that we do is in the abortion access um, space and we've done a lot of advocacy as well over the last um, two years or so in regards to finally decriminalizing um, abortion, which I'm not here to talk about, but that was a very exciting um, time for us. So, um, yay. Um, what I am here to talk about is about um, our journey around reproductive coercion over the last number of years. Um, talk a bit about what we've learned around the intersection between domestic violence and unplanned pregnancy and abortion and, and more specifically in regards to reproductive coercion as a, a perpetrator behavior and and then talking a bit about where um, some of you may sit in regards to how that um, information might um, impact um, in regards to the work that um, you're doing um, around unplanned pregnancy and abortion access. Um, just to point out, at Children by Choice, we are trying to use more inclusive language. So I will use terms like pregnant person and pregnant people along with a uh, woman. So acknowledging that some of our clients may not identify um, as female or as a woman. So just, just um, to point that out. Um, so in regards to our story or our journey um, around um, reproductive coercion, um, many years ago, back around 2013, 2014, um, like many, um, I think, services in this area, we were seeing a lot more clients expressing domestic violence as part of their story and when they were coming to Children by Choice for support. But our counsellors were also um, really mindful of stories around, we didn't have a name for it um, back then, around tactics that the um, controlling partner were using in regards to a um, uh, person's decision making in regards to things like contraception and um, pressure in regards to pregnancy and um, sabotaging contraception and um, and coercion then in regards to the decision making or the access to and um, the pregnant person's preferred option so we were fortunate at the time that we had um, Professor Heather Douglas on our management committee, who um, was a professor at the University of Queensland. Um, and she put us in touch with the pro bono legal center there to um, partner with them to do some research in regards to what we were seeing um, as part of the stories that clients were telling us and whether there was a link in regards to domestic violence and, and these, these perpetrator behaviours in regards to unplanned pregnancy and what was kind of happening. Um, and so the findings um, from that research found um, a lot of research and work had been done outside of Australia and a lot of work over the in the States and other parts um, of Europe around and um, the link and the intersection between unplanned pregnancy and domestic violence. Um, and yes, there is a very strong link um, between domestic violence and unplanned pregnancy. Um, so the research was telling us that um, uh, women or pregnant people who experience domestic violence um, are also two to three times more likely to experience the termination of pregnancy um, as well. So we're seeing a really strong link between domestic violence, unplanned pregnancy and repeat um, abortions. And I think when we think about that and we think about um, people that might be in a controlling relationship, negotiating um, safe sex and making decisions and plans in regards to pregnancy are often much more compromised in those type of controlling relationships. And what the research was hinting at is um, a new term for us, uh, at least um, back then in 2014, was around and um, what was termed in the states reproductive coercion and um, so 
and um, practices by a male perpetrator are um, known as reproductive coercion. Um, and so this is a bit of a, I guess, a, a definition um, in regards to reproductive coercion that we've kind of, um, I guess, amalgamated um, together. So it's any perpetrator behavior aimed at establishing or maintaining power and control in a relationship by interfering with a woman or pregnant person's reproductive autonomy, denying them control, decision-making, access to options in regards to reproductive health choices. Um, and this is something very much that we did see um, and do still see at Children by Choice, particularly in regards to relationships where um, a perpetrator is trying to maintain power and control over um, their partner and controlling their reproductive autonomy, particularly in regards to um, pregnancy is a, a really um, interesting tactic to use in regards to gaining control. And so the research tells us that that um, perpetrator practice in regards to reproductive coercion can be, I guess, classified in a number of different um, uh, types. Um, so what we've talked about there is um, pregnancy pressure. So actively trying to um, get um, the partner pregnant. So, um, you know, terms like, if you love me, you would get pregnant. Um, you're obviously sleeping around. If you don't want to get pregnant to me, if you don't want to have my child, and those kind of coercive behaviors in regards to um, pregnancy. Um, and obviously also what would fit into that is um, sexual assault um, in regards to actively trying to um, get the woman um, pregnant. Contraceptive, contraceptive sabotage um, is another um, um, uh, method that can be used um, and I think a lot of us are familiar with um, perpetrator practices like stealthing, so um, removing a condom during sex and um, refusing to use a condom. Um, we would also um, see clients um, where a partner is um, um, hiding contraception and um, even forcibly removing devices so even IUDs and implanon devices being forcibly removed and um, by um, perpetrators so actively trying to prevent um, the, the partner from using contraception and using contraception effectively um, and the final one then is in regards to pregnancy outcome control and um, so when a woman is pregnant and um, in regards to the outcome of that um, pregnancy decision and um, so forcibly um, trying to prevent her from accessing one option um, or also trying to coerce or put pressure on her. Um, the pregnancy outcome control has been an interesting one for us, um, particularly um, in regards to um, with law reform over the last um, year, where there was a lot of concerns around um, a, a partner forcing a woman to terminate a pregnancy. Um, what we find um, in regards to reproductive coercion, that it's actually the opposite. So our data is telling us that it's more likely when a, a, a perpetrator is using reproductive coercion as a method of control, that they're actually trying to coerce the woman or force the woman to continue the pregnancy. And I think when we think about a woman having a child to a perpetrator, um, it's a really powerful way to control that woman. So and actively trying to get her to continue that pregnancy and have that child will allow them that ongoing um, uh, control over that woman and um, potentially forever if they if they have that child with the man. So there will always be that connection. Um, something else that we found in the research and we find in our data is that um, reproductive coercion can often be experienced in isolation and is often the first um, method of um, control that our clients tell us and that they're actually starting to notice that they there may not be anything else that's happening in their relationship that they would identify as control. But when our counselors work with them in regards to and um, what reproductive coercion looks like and how it manifests itself, that's often the first experience that they've had of control that they're identifying as part of their story. Kylie, can I just check in? How's Sam going there? Are people still able to hear me? Yes. Nothing on the chat that says anyone's got any dramas. So, uh, okay, that's good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I thought going on from the research, our journey then was in regards to well, what, what do we do um, with this research and how do we move things forward? So we successfully um, received funding for um, a project called the Screening to Safety Project from Perpetual Trustees back in 2016. And that project ran 
um, up until um, last year, so the end of the financial year last year. And that project allowed us to um, hire a project officer to implement a couple of strategies that we felt um, would help us in addressing um, this intersection around unplanned pregnancy and particularly unplanned pregnancy and domestic violence and particularly around reproductive coercion. So our, the aim of that project was to build the capacity of um, uh, particularly health practitioners in Queensland to um, understand and identify that link between domestic violence and unplanned pregnancy and with a particular focus on reproductive coercion and where re reproductive coercion kind of overlaps in regards to that link between domestic violence and unplanned pregnancy and, and termination of pregnancy. So we did a lot of training around the state um, with um, health practitioners and particularly um, in abortion clinics. So the project really focused in on um, abortion clinics um, as a, a key leverage in regards to improving the supports that are provided for um, victims of reproductive coercion. So a lot of training with, um, with um, abortion clinics. And we also developed a screening tool um, in regards to um, reproductive coercion. And we also developed a range of um, resources around reproductive coercion. Um, these resources are available on our website and I'm happy if anybody wants to contact me and get more resources. One is a very small little resource that kind of um, talks through a couple of questions um, for the woman in regards to reproductive coercion. So questions like who controls the decision making in regards to um, pregnancy? Are are you comfortable talking to your partner with uh, in regards to contraception? So a really lovely small little resource that can be used um, either by the woman themselves or with the support of a practitioner. The other key focus of the project was in regards to contraception. So um, as you all will be familiar with, um, for somebody who's experiencing domestic violence, um, leaving that relationship can often be a very long um, journey for some women. It may not happen immediately. There may be a lot of supports that are required. Um, so what we really wanted to do is be able to provide a really concrete support um, for the woman, um, particularly at that point when they're at the clinic, if there is reproductive coercion and being identified. And so the project did a lot of work in regards to contraception access. So we had funding um, where if... Um, a clinic were identifying that a woman was experiencing reproductive coercion where we had a, some funding that we could support the woman to access um, a method of contraception that is less um, tamperable um, by the controlling partner um, and also um, a method that would allow them preferably more long-term um, uh, contraceptive um, support. So particularly looking at long-acting reversible contraceptive methods that may be suitable for um, that person. So we were taking away the barrier that might be there in regards to access and, and giving the, the woman an opportunity to think about her situation and what might be some um, reliable contraceptive methods that she could use um, and that, that is um, most appropriate for her situation and the control that she's experiencing. And we also developed a really lovely um, resource. And again, we call this the beast. There was a lot of work that went into this project, a lot of consultation with health practitioners and services. Um, and I know it's quite hard probably for you to see, but what this resource does is it talks through the various methods of contraception and kind of rates them in regards to um, how suitable they may be for someone that's experiencing reproductive coercion. And um, so what might be the, the benefits of some methods over others, depending on the type of control that the, the, the um, patient is experiencing. And the resource also talks through information around reproductive coercion and some kind of key points in regards to um, what we know about reproductive coercion and the link between unplanned pregnancy and domestic violence. Um, so that's what we did with that project. Unfortunately, the project, the funding did end. Um, but as I said, we have loads of resources that we would be happy to share with you. And there's a lot of information available on our website um, as well. Um, I just wanted to talk a bit more about what we learned on that journey um, and I'm going to kind of throw a, a fair bit of um, research um, at you next but I guess thinking about the clients that you support and thinking about what we know about domestic violence and its link with um, unplanned pregnancy and termination of pregnancy, how that might 
intersect with the work that you may be doing with pregnant people, either in regards to decision making around an unplanned pregnancy, but also in regards to contraception. Um, so a couple of points here in regards to um, decision making and apologies if, you, if this is already something that you're aware of. Um, but just thinking about the decision around pregnancy options and for someone that's experiencing domestic violence, um, that those experiencing violence um, are more likely to name um, issues with the partner as their reasons for terminating the pregnancy. And often that um, is related to the control that they're experiencing, that that is a factor in them deciding to terminate the pregnancy. Um, we know that the pregnancy can also be an impetus to end an abusive relationship. So um, when a woman is pregnant, that, that um, concerns in regards to keeping her self safe, but also keeping a potential child safe, and um, can be the, the catalyst for them to end an abusive relationship. We also know in regards to, and you probably are very aware of the um, research in regards to um, patterns of violence um, when someone is pregnant. So a pregnancy can actually be a point where violence does actually start. And um, so prior to the pregnancy, there the, the, the um, the patient wasn't experiencing any control, but once the pregnancy has started, um, there is a, 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 a start of um, control or domestic violence or an increase um, in that control being experienced. And um, at Children by Choice, we often talk about um, sometimes the um, pregnancy decision can be quite changed based on a change in circumstance. So potentially a wanted pregnancy um, and then a start in violence will be um, can put that decision completely on its head and um, for the pregnant person in regards to whether they want to continue that pregnancy given the start of this uh, of the violence or an escalation of violence in the relationship. There is some interesting research in regards to um, perpetrators where um, the amount of violence is actually reduced um, once the pregnancy starts. Um, some interesting research from the UK um, working with perpetrators that has actually found that the reason why that um, violence um, decreases isn't as a result of the perpetrator changing behaviors or being more caring or um, anything like that. It's actually that the pregnancy in and of itself is enough control so that the perpetrator doesn't feel that he needs to um, uh, show as much control because the pregnancy in and of itself is a, is a method of control for them. And um, so again, some interesting research there in regards to that. Um, the other thing that, to be mindful of is in regards to contraception um, use and thinking about um, women experiencing domestic violence and how that might impact on their contraception use or on the contraception use that might be most appropriate um, for them. And so the research tells us that women experiencing domestic violence are less likely to be using contraception. And as I alluded to already, if you're in a controlling relationship and um, you often and um, those decisions often aren't um, something that you have the, 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 the power and control over. So somebody else is making those decisions. Um, requesting contraception use can also be a trigger um, for violence. So again, be mindful of that. So um, negotiating condom use is often going to be really difficult as well. So um, there's a perception that negotiating condom use um, can also lead to um, domestic violence. So being really mindful of those methods um, of use um, if someone is in a, a violent relationship. And a little bit of research that's been done in regards to um, male perpetrators and um, perceptions in regards to condom use. Um, so um, more likely to view condom use negatively and their request for condom use negatively, less likely to use condoms and condom use is more inconsistent and more likely to, to um, engage in forced unprotected sex. And interesting that that is regardless of a lot of the perpetrators in that piece of research and um, were having sex with multiple partners um, as well. And so still engaging in forced unprotected sex um, as part of that, um, that, that control that was being exhibited. And um, so I guess what does that mean um, for us that are um, working with and supporting um, uh, people in regards to unplanned pregnancy and abortion? Um, so I guess um, being able to support um, someone to identify domestic violence and reproductive coercion tactics 
um, I think is really important and I'm sure you've done lots of work in regards to this in regards to um, believing um, the person's story um, and perhaps also putting a lens or um, putting some um, light on some of that experience particularly in regards to reproductive coercion so lots of um, people don't actually identify reproductive coercion as a form of control so you may be the first person that's that's putting that lens on it in regards to reproductive coercion so even asking questions um, such as do you think your partner was actively trying to get you pregnant can be a really um interesting question to ask in regards to alluding to some of those um some of those tactics that the the woman may not be aware of and um, some groups to pay particular attention to um young people with um there, there's research from the states to show that young women are um, more vulnerable to reproductive coercion as a, a tactic of control um, and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women and women from culturally and linguistically diverse women our diverse communities are overrepresented in our data and I should point out at this stage for this presentation I'm talking very much about a male perpetrator um, and um, uh, in regards to the control that's been exerted but we do know that for some of our clients the reproductive coercion may not be coming from a male perpetrator, it may be coming from a community member, it may be coming from um, the community at large as well. So again, being mindful um, of some of those groups um, is really important in the support that we provide. Um, screening and responding to unplanned pregnancy risks. So if you are um, speaking with somebody and you feel that reproductive coercion um, is part of their story, is there an opportunity to use emergency contraception at that stage? How recent was the, the, the sex? Um, and also pregnancy testing. So could they be um, currently pregnant while you're supporting them? And obviously being able to provide them with supports around pregnancy decision making and, and pregnancy options. Um, really, really important one then is in regards to contraception. So as I've alluded to already, um, the woman may not be in a position to um, um, leave the relationship, but um, access to particularly long-acting reversible contraception can be extremely powerful um, for women so that at least they can have, um, whether it's an IUD and um, whether it's an implant on that's been inserted, that they can have that control over their reproductive autonomy. And again, thinking about what might be most appropriate um, for that woman is, is, is really, really important. Um, I'm going to do a little case study now that I'm going to read out and I hope I'm going okay for time um, and maybe give you a couple of minutes to have a chat about it and then we can maybe ask some questions um, um, and talk a bit more about, about some of our thoughts in regards to this. So I'm just going to introduce you to Stacey. Um, so Stacey is 25. You supported her twice last year to access an abortion and emergency contraception. The last time you referred her to another local GP to get the Mirena device inserted. She has hinted that things are not going that good at home. Her boyfriend, Troy, is driving her crazy. He wants to know everything she does, even when she has her periods. She tells you that she didn't get the Mirena because Troy didn't want her to. She tells you she's worried she's pregnant again as she's a couple of weeks late for her period uh, and she's been feeling sick. She did a test at home and it was positive, but she heard that they are sometimes wrong. 